today uh, I will give a presentation together with uh, Alexander uh, Fazena. He's uh, still in hiding, but he will uh, pop out uh, quite soon uh, for us. Uh, and indeed, today we will give a, uh, uh, an, uh, a story about uh, how we're creating a method for quantitative evaluation of functional change supported by a Capella add-on. Uh, but first of all, I would like to, uh, to give uh, uh, a short overview. So uh, we're, uh, first I'm going to give an introduction on the, uh, on the workflows that we're actually targeting. And then Alexander is going to uh, mention the, uh, the method that we're working uh, on. Uh, and then uh, together we will give some, uh, some, uh, some conclusions and some answers on, uh, on what we've been doing. So uh, first of all, perhaps it's a good idea to, uh, to introduce our, um, uh, uh, the, the company that, uh, that, that we are representing. So I'm representing Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, which is, uh, as we say, uh, the, the world leader in surfing science. It's a, it's a big company with over 110,000 employees worldwide uh, with a yearly revenue of over $40, uh, $40 billion. Um, and we're uh, situated all around the world. Uh, we have multiple uh, div uh, uh, groups in, uh, in uh, Thermo Fisher. And uh, the subject that we're talking about is in the analytical instruments group. And then below that, we have different divisions. And there, the division that I'm talking about is the material and structural analysis division. Um, and actually, um, the systems that I'm going to be talking about and that are subject to this, um, to this presentation are in the bottom, the ones encircled, which are our uh, transmission uh, electron microscopes. Um, to explain a bit about what a transmission electron microscope is, I can do that. I'll try to do that in a very high level. Um, so they're, they're quite bulky systems, they're quite big. So uh, with respect to dimensions, they're about uh, one and a half meter uh, square on the ground, uh, the systems themselves, uh, but they can be quite high. So uh, the, the short ones, uh, as we call them, uh, for the high-end uh, TEMs are, uh, are three meters tall, but they can grow up to uh, beyond four meters tall. Uh, they're also quite heavy, they weigh, about, uh, they weigh over 1600 kilograms. Uh, but the resolution that they achieve is uh, is amazing. They uh, they reach a resolution of uh, of 50 picometers, and of course you also have to uh, have to pay for that. So the uh, the entry level high le high end microscopes are, go from a million, but uh, the 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 advanced uh, advanced ones can go up to uh, 15 million dollars. Um, the applications that we serve them for uh, are various as well. So, uh, for instance, we're serving uh, the life sciences uh, um, business uh, in which our systems are being used for virus and cell structure research. Um, we also serve material science business, which uh, is mainly focused on uh, looking into chemical and material uh, in, uh, and investigating how these materials behave in, uh, under different conditions. Um, and of course, uh, semiconductor with ever shrinking uh, structures that they're making are also a very big uh, a portion of our uh, businesses that we serve. And there we're really fulfilling the part of uh, process analysis and control of the uh, uh, manufacturing process of uh, semiconductors. So, the background of why are we uh, are we looking into this uh, from uh, from a Capella perspective is that the the landscape for the system is quite complex. Uh, so currently we have uh, 15 active commercial TEM products, ranging from the high end systems, uh, mid range systems to uh, entry level systems. Uh, on that we have more than 20 customer facing applications. Um, and these systems uh, are uh, comprised uh, out of more than 400 different modules that we have. However, all these different uh, systems are served with one uh, software stack that we call TEM server. Um, in total, this amounts to more than a thousand active configurations in the field that we need to serve with, uh, with what we're doing. Uh, and an added uh, complexity to that 
is uh, the distributed development that we have. We're currently located uh, in four different sites in the US, uh, in, the US in uh, Brno, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, in Bordeaux in France, and also in Eindhoven uh, in the Netherlands. So how, how can we attack this problem of, of the different, uh, um, the, the large diff uh, different types of systems that we have and how do we serve our customers with that? Uh, for that, we have created something that we call the reference architecture. And this is a, a brief overview of what the reference architecture looks like. So it, um, it all starts with, uh, with customer value. So that's, of course, up, uh, on the top. Um, and you see that typically our systems are being used in a larger workflow because uh, in order to put a sample into a, a transmission electron microscope, it has to be prepared in order to be able to do so. So it needs to fit into the whole customer workflow. Then after that, you see that on the system itself, on our microscope, we also have a workflow. And that's what we call the system workflow. Um, so we look into how the where the value is within this uh, this workflow uh, for the system. If you know where the value is on, on on the workflows on the system, you you kind of know what what functions you have uh, in order to be able to to create this value. So that's the functional decomposition that comes after that. Once you've identified the different functions that you have on the system. Uh, you can actually kind of sketch how, what the system should look like from a uh, from a more uh, physical decomposition perspective. So you can start to make modules and define where these modules actually fit the different uh, functions. And that's what we call the system decomposition. Then if you, uh, if you look further down, you'll see that uh, uh, after you've made the system decomposition, you can actually look into creating the physical module and then uh, combining the different modules into a system configuration, which then in the end, ideally, will really uh, realize the customer value. The part in blue is what we call our TEM system reference architecture. So that's really about the workflows on the system, the functional decomposition and the system decomposition. And that really dictates what is expected from the system, what does the system really functionally do and uh, how does the system realize this? We created a, uh, a way of working on how to analyze these three things. Um, and the first of all is, of course, the workflow on the, uh, on the system itself. So we have a workflow analysis for, uh, for this. And, and like I already said, the most important part here is to identify the customer value. Where is the customer value for the, uh, for the customer? It can be uh, uh, in processing speed, or it can be in ultimate resolution, it can be uh, material identification. So you can have all kinds of different customer values depending on the customer that you're uh, making a system for. Given that customer value, you can identify the critical to quality parameters, or we can also call them KPI, key performance indicators. Um, given these, uh, these uh, uh, critical to quality parameters, they can be uh, attributed as parameters to different features. Uh, so for instance, if performance is, a, is an important goal for, uh, for your customer, uh, then you can attribute the different parts of your workflow, like loading a sample, imaging a sample, or different other parts of, your, of what you're doing on the system, and you can attribute that time into those steps. So the next step uh, after the workflow analysis is the functional decomposition. And yeah, as it states, it's really just the, uh, the decomposition of the system into the different functions that you have. On the right hand top side, you see a, uh, an image, uh, a very rudimentary image of a, a TEM microscope. And you really see that in this case, the optics part of the microscope has been decomposed into the different uh, uh, functions that we have there and every part of the system can be found in the different functions that are created. Um, 
So once you've done that, you can also attribute, again, these CTQ parameters to the different parts of the system. And a very in important thing to note there is that it should also cover software. So one thing that we noticed over time is that quite often uh, software is uh, forgotten in the uh, in the equation, but it's a natural. It should be a natural part of that. The next step after that is to decompose the system into the modules. So there you really decompose your different modules and you start to allocate the functions to the different modules that you can identify, and you can also identify the owners for those um, for those modules. Uh, an important part in doing this is actually that you create a logical grouping of these functions. And once you've done that, you can actually define the transfer function for the modules based on the function CTQ parameters that are created. Um, another topic uh, then, once you have all these modules, is to identify the interfaces between these modules. And that's extremely important for us because for us, compatibility, we have more than a thousand different configuration, uh, compatibility is key. So it's really important to identify what the interfaces between the different modules are. Uh, we also use this for risk management. So in our FMEA processes, we use these overviews. And it's also important to make sure that across the company, the naming of the different components is equal. And we have a system called taxonomy in which we also do that. Then the next step is to identify the technical compatibility. That means which type of module can work with another type of a module in a certain generation of a platform, for instance. And in that part, we map module compatibility to the systems. And we also include special systems that we call non-standard requests. And we also include backwards compatibility there. So this is basically the framework that we have for reference uh, architecture for our TEM microscopes. And our next step is actually to evolve this reference architecture and MBSE is what, how we do that at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, MBSE for us is really the tool to support our reference architecture. So we first had the reference architecture and then we selected a uh, model-based systems engineering uh, to support that in order to guarantee uh, consistency, ease maintainability and increase automation opportunities. So it's also important to have processes to, uh, to ensure this maintainability because our system is quite complex and big. Uh, we chose a system of systems approach with separate module models for the systems and system versions. And in this case, what I mentioned earlier as modules in uh, the analogy of uh, Capella in this case, they would be systems. And the TEM system, the TEM microscope is a system of systems. And this is how that would look like. Um, in the top left, you see the system of systems. That's our TM microscope, but it's a 150%. Does that mean it, uh, it's a combination of all the modules that are available there and all the functions that are available there, even if they're mutually exclusive? Then going down, we create a 150% representation of a module, or in this case, in Capella, it's called a system. And then we uh, create a system to subsystem transition horizontally into a 100% system. And there we can create a model for every different iteration that we have for a certain uh, part of the system. And there we can also go from the logical architecture down into physical architecture. Um, the system 100% can also be instantiated in a system of systems 100%, in which case we can actually create a full system as we would deliver it to our customer. So where are we now? Currently, we are making this move. So our, our reference architecture is in uh, tools like Visio, uh, and we're moving these uh, diagrams of functions and uh, system decompositions uh, into, uh, into Capella at this time. And we're also in that uh, paying close attention to the uh, interface specifications as Capella helps us there. So what we're also at the same time trying to do is maximize the benefits that we can have uh, uh, from model-based systems engineering. And that really focuses on the CTQ or KPI calculation. So 
we really want to attribute the model with these CTQ parameters uh, such that we can uh, extract the performance uh, based on this configuration. Eh? So if we have different modules in a system, the system might behave differently with respect to performance, and we want to be able to predict that. Uh, but if we do that, you can also predict reliability if you have uh, figures ab uh, about that. And, and using that, you can really define the customer value at design time. So in the image at the bottom, you see the steps that we're taking really to move from the reference architecture that we have really also into, in this case, a reliability prediction model. Now, Alexander is going to tell you about uh, how, together with uh, TNO AZ, we've been working on a way to make a quantitative uh, analysis for performance based configuration. So I will give the floor now to Alexander. Thank you so much, Jim. It was a very nice introduction, and we can see that. Uh, it's, uh, at the moment, you have functions. It's very interesting to look into quantitative values, how long it takes, and other parameters. Let me start by introducing the company I'm working for. It's um, AZ, part of TNO. AZ started in 2002, and it was acquired by TNO in 2013. We have about 60 staff members, many with industrial experiences, as well as seven part-time professors working for the universities in the Netherlands. Our feature is that we are working at industry locations and we specifically look at industry problems and together with our partners, uh, we solve the pressing needs uh, of our industry. We focus on managing complexity of high-tech systems. Our focus are system architecting, system level reasoning, model-driven engineering, model-based engineering, and we deliver methodologies validated in practice. On the right side of the slide, you can see a list of partners. Uh, among them, you can see Thermo Fisher, SML, Philips, Fundaland, and several others, um, as well as the several universities with whom we develop projects. Uh, at the bottom, you see Capgemini. It's a special kind of partner. It's our implementation partner. On this slide, you can see a meta model of uh, what we try to achieve, and we created in in Capella. So we would like to um, implement a possibility for quantifying a sequence of functions, for instance, for duration or other aspects. Um, in this formalism, uh, it means that a capability includes an engineer who makes decision, as well as uh, we need something in specific. This is a data source and calculation algorithm. We would like to follow several principles. We ensure reuse, avoid duplication. We would like to address multiple abstraction levels, keep models composable, accessible, and position Capella in the center of the MBSC landscape. Specifically, when talking about values like durations for functions, we want to pay attention to parallelism with resource sharing and account for iterations, branching, merging flows. In short, we need a simulation. Capella can provide us with very interesting opportunities for this, and we looked into simulating functional chains. From the previous presentation, we saw that functional chains is a very powerful concept. The reason is uh, the natural fit to uh, Capella, to Arcadia constructs. In this case, we connect to the Arcadia methodology. We can use the nodes like iteration, or end nodes, as well as precedes relations of the functional chains. At the same time, we need to specify a bit more. We would like to be a bit more clear what we mean with the nodes, what we mean with the properties, because Arcadia is oriented for uh, uh, systems engineers, for architects, but not directly for simulations. We need to make an extra step. A very short introduction to functional chains. Functional chain is a specific path among all possible paths. Capability is described by the functional chain, and functional chain involves functions. Let me give a short example. Uh, let us take a photo camera that can make images, and it can perform three functions, like acquire image, process image, 
and store each. Together, these functions form a functional chain called create image. Functional chain can be specified in more details, and this is really important for us, uh, that we can use uh, an idea of sequence links. Literally, it means precedes relation. The function process image in this function chain would uh, start after the function instance require acquire image. We would use this construct later on in the presentation. For those of you who are interested in functional modeling, uh, you can check uh, functional flow block diagram, which provide more information and pretty much connected to the idea of functional chain description in Kotlin. In a very short, what we would like to get. Here's a small example. Uh, let us uh, again look into images and uh, consider that after acquiring images, we would need to process the image. Here we do it in four steps and we store the image. We would like to know how long it takes. In this example, we assume that the uh, steps have duration of one second, 1.2 second, 1.3 and so on. And in total, we see the duration of 7.4 seconds. It can be done faster. And this is very interesting for us. If we parallelize the functions, assuming that you can process image in parallel, you can shorter the total time of this functional chain. This gives you a number of uh, very interesting um, you know, possibilities. For instance, you can try to uh, allocate uh, different resources to the functional chain elements or change the duration of functions or parallelize functions and see how actually it can help you. So this is an uh, activity of exploring your design options. Please note that uh, to make this calculation possible, we would like to have a resource ID and duration two elements which are added into the description of the functional instance. In a nutshell, the method consists of three steps. We create a functional chain that is suitable for simulations. We call it a simulatable functional chain. We export and run that chain, and then we visualize the result. We integrate our approach to the main constructs of Arcadia Capella. And on the right, you can see some examples. We use a function. For the function, we need to specify duration, resource ID, and maybe a description. We would use several constructs from the sequencing uh, window, and like end or iteration nodes, sequence link itself. And for instance, for a control node, as iteration, we would like to show how many times these iterations should be done. From the top level view, architecture looks like this. We need to specify a functional chain, including the property values needed for simulation. We perform a rule checker because we want to make sure this uh, chain can be simulated. After that, we export it using a PetriNet formalism make it uh, simulation ready. We use Puzzle for that. We'll describe that later on. We simulate the chain using Puzzle and visualize it in trace for CPS solution. I would like to have a small demo where we construct a 3D model out of 2D images. This is a typical task for uh, electron microscopes because uh, you need to construct, for instance, a model of a virus out of many images made during the day or during a significant period of time. In this case, uh, saving some time on every image can be highly beneficial. We would highlight a library of functional chains and as well as a generated graph in this demo. Let's look at the general functions that we want to uh, incorporate into the demo. And this is a 3D reconstruction. We take the steps of initiating reconstruction, acquiring an image, processing an image, and creating a 3D image from 2D images. What you can expect is shown on the right side of the slide. We would like to create a functional chain in Capella. We will use Puzzle to simulate that. And we visualize the GAN chart using the tool called Trace for CPS.
let's move to the compiler. In this view, you can see uh, it's functional decomposition for a 3D reconstruction. Each step can be decomposed even further. Let's look into the step acquire 2D image. To acquire an image, uh, you would like to have uh, to prepare for that, move to the next position, acquire image, and finalize acquisition. If we describe it as a functional chain, then functional chain acquire 2D image would look exactly like that, including four different functions. Let's look into the sequencing information of that functions. Here, you see the iteration nodes. Iteration nodes show how many times you would like to acquire an image. We would like to show in this example that uh, you'd like to have a specific function that is uh, simulatable. Let's delete an item, a sequence link. And right now, our functional chain although still valid, is not suitable for simulation because we don't know which function should follow after which. We would like to say that after preparing an acquisition, you start iteration, you move to the next position, then you acquire an image, and then you continue the iterations. At the end, you finalize the 2D acquisition. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have the information about uh, starting function 1.2, when to start it. We provided some support for the user. And in this case, you can see that the model has some errors. We know which errors are, and we can fix them by constructing a sequence link. Right now, the model is back to normal, and we can simulate it. Before doing that, I would like to show uh, so how can you specify values for iterations and duration of functions. We used a PVMT add-on to describe properties of iterations. And here you see it would be 10 repetitions. As well, we can see the duration of each function. In each fun in the, this function takes 0 0.1 second, 1 second, 5 seconds and finish with 0 0.1 second. Let us simulate this uh, functional chain. As a first step, we would like to export it. And we use it uh, uh, the context menu for that. After exporting the chain, uh, we obtain um, a folder with information built according to this functional chain specification. For instance, we can look at the, um, at the model we would like to simulate. This is a, a PetriNet formalism, which describes quite strict in a quite strict way how to how this function takes uh, form, how it should be simulated. Um, the simulation code, the puzzle code, is also generated, and we can see this uh, uh, in the editor. Normally, the user doesn't need to look into such details. Luckily, just, just moment, for, for yes. info, we, we have 10 minutes left for the talk or 20 minutes for the, the whole session. Yes, thank you. Um, then uh, maybe I can make a bit faster. Awesome. Uh, then uh, let me quickly show you the results of the simulation. We need to run the simulation inside the environment. And now we know that executing this chain will take 60 seconds. We can look in more details how this would look on the Gantt chart. So you can see uh, the, the total duration as well as uh, uh, 10, 10 iterations. Let's move on and let's uh, look into a bit more detailed uh, uh, story of uh, processing. So to process a 2D image, we will, again, we need several functions and we need to specify uh, their information. An extra construct we have is the OR node, which means that uh, one of the two paths should be taken. 
um, we specify the probabilities or better say weights of um, of each path by attributing values to the sequence lists. In this case, the weight for both sequence links would be one, which means that about 50% of time uh, the function should be executed and 50% time the execution will not include the function. Everything else on this uh, chain has the same logic. We need to proceed 10 times and at the end we need to finalize the processing of the image. Let's uh, quickly illustrate this and um, simulate the model. And now we know it would take 34 seconds. We can see that not after every execution, you need to take the step of processing to the image. An interesting thing is that you can combine these functional chains into a larger function chain, constructing more realistic examples. Let's look at the functional chain, which combines both of them. Here we can see acquire to the image and process to the image. In addition to the described concepts, we introduce here a control node uh, called end, meaning that both parts should be executed before creating a 3D image from 2D images. Another interesting thing on this figure is uh, the precedes links that connects uh, functions within functional chains. We uh, need to acquire to the image before starting the pre-process to the image. And of course, uh, the pre-processing should be already um, executed after preparing the 2D image uh, processing. Let's look uh, into the simulating of this functional chain. We'll use again the same steps. And we obtain an interesting visualization where we can see how exactly the functional chain would proceed. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight is the resource allocation. It is very interesting to see if something can be paralyzed or not. And uh, a big role is do you share the same resource for that? For instance, the same microprocessor or maybe you need to store something, you, you use another resource. In this case, we have uh, a resource for function acquired to the image. We have resource ID 42, and we would like to have the same resource for another function. Let us save it and proceed with the same steps. Right now, you can see that the duration is uh, significantly increased. We have 103 seconds to execute this function chain. What is also interesting is that uh, we can use which uh, resources are involved. By using the trace for CPS, we can show that the most load is done by the resource 42. So it, it can provide the uh, systems engineer an interesting idea that you can offload this resource and by doing this you can make the total time shorter there is additional functionality to the trace for cps like critical path analysis but i would not show it right now in the view of time i would like to highlight the idea that you can experiment with different settings and uh, with different resources allocation uh, probabilities of arcs these are rather simple concept but they are very powerful they can be directly used by the systems engineer and an interesting thing they can be on the different level of capella you can construct functional chains for different purposes at the logical architecture and physical architecture let us return to the presentation to briefly show what happens behind the scenes is um, uh, several things um, we have a formalized model 
this is a mathematical description. We want to make sure that the model is ready for simulations. We use a property value definition, as already shown. Here we can see the profile of the PVMT add-on with some values. We perform a transformation from a functional chain to a Petri net formalism and then to a simulation in Puzo. A reference for those interested in Puzzle, you can find it on the puzzle.org. To highlight, this is a simulation of parallel process with the well-defined semantics. Trace for CPS is also uh, and to, available to everyone. And uh, it, it has the functionality of critical path analysis, customi customizing using the different attributes. And you already see different views and visualizations. To quickly reflect on the experiences, we validated the approach uh, on exams like what we show through interviews and industrial cases. One example of an industrial case we took is um, uh, to construct a global chain which consists of 12 functional chains that has four levels of nesting, three levels of functions, and a set of reusable functions. It was about 35 functions reused several times. It was easy to explain the model to the stakeholders because it provides a clear traceability. We can quickly explore a number of options. And very importantly, we relate to the Arcadia constructs. So people who understand Arcadia can quickly start using this approach. We used functions, functional chains, components. Also, it's good to remember several things. Complexity can go very quickly. At the moment you show the model, quite often you get requests to extend it with extra information. When you reuse a functional chain several times, you need to be very clear what you use and in which context. Maybe you need to make a copy of the functional chain. You can construct a number of other links to Arcadia layers, for instance, to configuration items. It can be very useful, but you need to be careful to maintain your overview. If you have more than one person involved, you need to agree on the modeling convention. Taxonomy and other things can clearly help. We constructed a tool chain, which means that every tool, every element can be updated independently of another. You need to pay attention to their version. As a general reflection, there is an entry bar for such projects. You would like to have Arcadia and Capella knowledge, programming skills, and understanding of the capabilities of different tools. As you may have seen, uh, I had to perform a number of picks to uh, demonstrate an alternative uh, uh, to a functional chain. Right now, we're developing a design space exploration tool where these actions would be greatly simplified. We would like to specify minimum and maximum durations, iteration numbers, weights of arcs, and different allocations of functions to resources. At the same time, when you have uh, such a comprehensive structure, you can think of uh, other models. You can use the same model for as input for calculations on costs and reliability. You would need to specify parameters and maybe export components to specialized tools. On the right, you see an early example how the tool can look like. In short, we created a way to simulate functional chains by providing a formalism, exporting it, and visualizing the results. We would write a generic report, for instance, a paper, so it would be available on the approach. As well, we are considering to release the code. We are positive about that, but we would like to firstly check about the licensing and vision of the stakeholders of the project. If you are interested in the topic of model-based systems engineering and high-tech industry, please consider checking the report of AZ and as well the Transact project, which would provide a native integration of Puzzle and Trace for CPS. With this, I would like to give the floor back. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Alexander. Um, so 
uh, I will close uh, with uh, with the conclusions that we have uh, from uh, from our perspective. So, uh, looking at the solution space that we uh, that we have, um, the proof of concept has been delivered by uh, by AZ um, with the simulation of workflows, as you have seen, with also a complete uh, integration into uh, into Capella of external tools. Um, and for us, the systems engineering goal really is to uh, to prevent a, a double recording of information. And that's why it was uh, key to have this integrated into Capella, because the models of our systems are already in Capella. Um, and actually, so the, the latter point that, uh, that Alexander uh, showed is that they're currently working on a design space exploration tool. And that really helps us in maximizing the customer value uh, over time using this tool. So with respect to the next steps, um, of course, the collaboration with AZ that we've done is, uh, uh, yeah, is very, uh, very helpful, very useful. Uh, the way we've worked is with uh, short development uh, and review cycles at which we uh, continuously looked at, uh, uh, at the goals that we were trying to achieve. Um, and we regularly checked on the uh, on the deliverables as well. Um, and the the most interesting part of this was really to apply the scientific methods in the industry on the specific use case that we had. Uh, for us as Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, the uh, the next steps are uh, to use Capella, the Capella model as an authoritative source of truth, as we call it. And as you can see in the in the model on the right uh, bottom, uh, you see that Capella, in that sense, is, is really the center of our tool uh, of yeah of our tool set uh, containing the model, um, and the information from that model can then be used in all kind of different tools that can help uh, uh, different causes. So, for instance, you saw a demonstration of Puzzle. Uh, they're now working on the design space exploration tool. Uh, but also we're looking into uh, co connecting it to our requirements management tool, which in this case is Yama. Um, and in the future, there may, may be many, many other tools that can be used uh, as uh, to further extend the, um, the value that we get from our model-based systems engineering tool, Capella, in this case. And with that, I would like to turn it back to the presenter for the Q&A. Yep, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, we just have five minutes, but it should be fine. We have just two questions so far. I'm sure we'll have more. Um, okay, maybe the, the, well, the first one uh, is already answered, but you can elaborate a bit. Uh, to, to which degree do you employ simulation data? Then what simulation tools do you interface with Capella? I have to say that the question was raised at the very beginning of your presentation. So probably you you provide with a, a lot of answer. So. Yeah, I, I can briefly mention that uh, indeed we used Puzzle. At the same time, uh, we um, employed PetriNet formalism. So you can also consider other options because it's already rather strict description which can be used for simulations. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in order to get to these reliability figures, we use uh, Design for Six Sigma internally. And then uh, the idea is to really use these uh, these numbers that are defined for different parts of the system and really to just use them the same way as, as Alexander has shown in the demo as properties that you can attribute to the different parts of the system and then just use it as a, as a different type of data. Okay, thanks for that. So next question. Uh, are the reasons to name parameters, uh, which seems to be requirements, uh, uh, if, if parameters are not requirements, how do you manage your requirements and link them to the parameters? Yeah, I can start with that. Um, we specifically look at um, what can be options to, uh, to, to, to realize your system. In this case, this is uh, at the moment you explore different alternatives. 
you can say that the same, let's say, platform like a computer would perform several functions, right? Or you can employ a number of computers to perform these functions. And this is a choice how your functions would be allocated to components. Can you parallelize this? These are all the options you would like to consider. In this case, it's not requirements yet, because at the moment you make a good choice, they can become requirements. Yeah, indeed. I, I would like to second that, indeed. I, I agree with that uh, in the sense that you're, you're trying, of course, there's a number of requirements uh, that are really requirements. But in this case, it's really looking into the design space, uh, what which things are not really requirements yet, but can be fiddled around with to get the maximum customer value out of your system. Okay, thanks for that. And probably the last questions. Uh, well, okay, uh, this is a question from someone who used to uh, use SizeML, uh, and the question is about the, the control flow and how you, you perform uh, the control, actually. And actually, we, we already answered partially this, uh, this question, uh, saying that actually control flow exists in Capella. But probably you have you have more to to add in this in this regard. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think control flows is a very important uh, but advanced topic of Capella. You indeed can use uh, nodes like and or something that we already have shown. In this case, it's not uh, a flow of information, it's a flow of control, and uh, you can. See at the, uh, as the functional flow diagram. I think uh, we we use this one. We had to add a bit of formalism to that, but we largely covered this topic. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Well, unfortunately, we we have to switch to our next speakers. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your presentation. Um, well. I hope we'll see, see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.